Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video here on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to be taking a look at some questions submitted by some of the fine folks who help contribute to support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. Thank you very much to uh, all of you guys, it is you that makes this channel possible. Now, without further ado, let us begin with a question from George, who says, Could you explain Gain Twist Rifling? Is it effective, and wouldn't it be ideal for making carbines that are both short in barrel length yet highly accurate? Yes, progressive twist rifling is effective in that it, it does stabilize bullets. However, I think, George, you have a somewhat something of a misunderstanding of the, the relationship between barrel length and accuracy, because it really does not take a long barrel to adequately stabilize a bullet. Uh, in fact, a two-inch revolver will adequately, effectively stabilize a revolver bullet. Uh, and there's nothing different about a rifle. A couple inches at most is really all you need to actually get the bullet spinning at the proper RPM to be stable. Gain twist rifling is kind of a different thing. So first off, what gain twist is, is it means that the pitch of the rifling varies over the length of the barrel. So uh, we typically think of rifling as one in X. Uh, in, in US measurements we'd think of it as one in ten, or one in eight, or one in twelve. And that is the number of rotations uh, that the bullet makes over that many inches of barrel length. So typical for 5.56, for example, would be between 1 in 7 inch. So the, the bullet turn making one full revolution in 7 inches out to like 1 in 14. So one revolution in 14 inches. And different, uh, the, the speed of the twist, the, the rate of uh, revolution of the bullet, uh, needs to be sufficient to stabilize the bullet without overstabilizing it. The proper number for that depends on a bunch of factors, primarily the length and diameter of the bullet, as well as to some extent its shape. And that's a hugely technical discussion that we're not going to go into today, figuring out what twist is appropriate. What gain twist is, is instead of having a, a the same rate of twist throughout the barrel, Gain twist barrels start with a very slow twist, might be 1 in 25, and then they slowly accelerate the bullet until at the muzzle end of the, the barrel it's spinning at its final RPM, um, its final twist rate as necessary to stabilize it. So why would you do this? Uh, it is certainly more difficult to manufacture than a standard barrel, and that's part of why we generally don't see gain twist rifles being made today. So there's really one place where gain twist rifling has a real advantage, and that is in pressure. So if you have a bullet that has a lot of surface area in contact with the barrel, when you fire it, just initially, when it's starting to accelerate down the barrel, you're going to have a lot more friction. You've got to do a lot more work to engrave this rifling and, and crush this bullet into the rifling as it starts to spin. This is relevant on relatively large calibers. For example, the 20mm Vulcan is a, a cartridge that is in US service, at least, uh, typically a gain twist barrel. And in fact they go one step beyond just having a gain twist. In the Vulcan they have an actual copper band around the bullet that sits on the rifling, and the body of the bullet doesn't. Uh, however, a gain twist means that because it's only doing a little bit of rotation at the beginning of its travel, you're going to have lower pressure. It's going to be easier to get that bullet started down the barrel. Once it's started, then you can speed up the twist of the, the bullet revolution, or the, you can increase the rate of revol revolution of the bullet until it gets to what you need it to be for accuracy. Uh, the other application of this would be in rifle cartridges, but especially relatively small bore rifles that have very long bullets, namely the early round nose projectiles in 6.5mm. Not all uh, of these sorts of rifles used gain twist rifling. In fact, really only one did, and that was the Italian Carcano. It was this was a big military secret weapon for the Italians at the time, which turns out to have not really been all that important. Uh, but the early versions of 6.5 Carcano used a very long round nose bullet. Um, it's actually the same bullet that you'll see used in the Kennedy assassination. However, that bullet it, it spikes pressure in the gun if you fire that with a standard twist barrel, because it's trying to spin it up to its to a fairly high rate of revolution very quickly, that causes a, a pressure spike. So what the Italians did was used a gain twist instead, so it starts out turning slowly, once it gets moving down the barrel then you can speed it up. That is where gain twist is useful. 
Uh, this doesn't, by the way, this doesn't typically apply to rifle cartridges anymore because we have discovered that a Spitzer cartridge is a much more aerodynamic option. And so today we have much more teardrop shaped bullets in general, boat tails, you know, uh, the, the bullet comes back in on itself at the tail end, the tip is pointed, uh, and they just generally have much less surface area in contact with the barrel than something like a round nose 6.5 Carcano would have. So gain twist isn't necessary, and because it is more expensive and difficult to manufacture, no reason to bother with it. Next question is from Paul says, how does the old 6.5 Japanese Arasaka round compare to the more modern 6.x millimeter rounds, such as 6.5 Creedmoor, 6.8 SBC, or 6.5 Grendel? Uh, again, there's I think a bit of a misunderstanding built into this question, namely that 6.5 Creedmoor and 6.5 Grendel or 6.8 SBC have very little in common. There are two different rationales for those 6.5 cartridges. The 6.5 Creedmoor is designed to be a very efficient long-range cartridge, and it's basically started on a 30 caliber rifle cartridge. It's full a full rifle length cartridge, and by necking it down from say 308 to 6.5 millimeter, you know, seven and a half millimeter down to six and a half millimeter, uh, you can get a much better ballistic coefficient. It retains its energy better and stays supersonic over a longer uh, distance of travel. With the 6.8 uh, SPC and 6.5 Grendel, what the, the goal was to increase bullet weight but retain the ability to be used in an AR-15 magazine uh, system. So with a, a very strict overall length limit, how do you increase the bullet weight on 5.56? Well you neck it up to, in this case, 6.5 or 6.8. Um, however the velocity on those cartridges is substantially lower than something like 6.5 Creedmoor because they are very strictly limited to a much smaller case, much lower case capacity. Now the, the World War I era 6.5 rifle rounds, like the 6.5 Carcano and the 6.5 Japanese, are actually fairly similar, a little bit hotter than typically the AR conversion calibers, like 6.5 Grendel. Um, they did have a much larger case to work with, but they typically weren't, weren't loaded to quite as high of a pressure, they weren't quite as efficient of a round. Um, so ballistically, just, just above 6.8 and 6.5 Grendel, uh, but substantially below something like 6.5 Creedmoor. Uh, next up we have a question from Laura, who says, when the US entered World War I, they discovered they had a great shortage of rifles. Indeed. Uh, to address this, they took the P-14 Enfield, being manufactured commercially in the US for Great Britain, modified it to 30 6 and adopted it as the 1917 Enfield. Having fired one, I believe the American Enfields are fantastic rifles and IMO, superior to the 1903A1 Springfield. The 1903 Springfield. Uh, why then did the US scrap or decommission most of their Enfield rifles following the war? The 1903 would not be brought up to par with the 1917 until the A3 revision just before World War II. This is especially odd considering the Army had more Enfields than Springfields. All of your facts are exactly correct, Laura. Uh, the US in fact manufactured substantially more 1917 Enfields than they did 1903 Springfields. They fielded something like three times as many Enfields in World War I uh, with the actual combat troops, and at the end of the war had about twice as many Enfields uh, available as they did Springfields. At the end of the war there was a commission put together to decide which of those two rifles to keep as the US main standard, and which one to relegate to uh, secondary and uh, secondary status and put into storage, and they ultimately decided to keep the 1903 Springfield for a couple of reasons, some good and some lame. The good reasons were uh, primarily around manufacture. So the Springfield was manufactured as the name implies, by the US Springfield Armory. This was at the time a government run uh, manufacturing facility. The Springfield we have today is a private company that has basically nothing to do with the original government Springfield facility. So after World War I there were potentially some labor issues uh, with the commercial company, commercial rifle factories, and remember that the 1917 Enfield was entirely manufactured by uh, third-party commercial companies. So if you're in the government's shoes, the idea of maintaining the rifle that you produce yourself has a definite appeal compared to getting rid of your own production capability and relying entirely on outside contractors to make firearms. 
This also is a reason that explains why a lot of countries will sometimes adopt subpar rifles. You may look at it and go, why, why did they build that weird thing themselves when they could have just bought Rifle Axe, Mausers, or they could have just bought M16s from America? The answer is often the country wants to have its own domestic, secured um, arms production system. And that was the good part of the reason why the US kept the 1903. Uh, they also had all the training in hand, they had all the spare parts, they had the logistics. Some of that had been developed for the 1917 over the course of a couple years in the war, but it, it existed in a much more fundamental way for the 1903. Now what might actually be the more substantial reason they kept the 1903, and is definitely the really pathetic reason to keep the 1903, is that it was a better match rifle. Uh, in service qualification and in national match competition, the 1903 Springfield was superior because it had a, sight, a set of sights that were specifically designed whether intentionally or not. They ended up being perfectly aligned to the national match competition targets. Uh, namely, they had a rear aperture sight that was minuscule. But it works really well with that 600 yard known distance bullseye from national match competition. The 1917 Enfield had a much larger ap rear aperture sight. It was fantastic for combat. It was unequivocally a better combat rifle. But national match qualification scores, not so great. And so in, in something that we see repeated often enough to be, well, kind of depressing sometimes from a military perspective, they decided to keep the one that looked better on the range and the qualification scores and get rid of the one that was actually the better combat rifle. Uh, definitely not a good decision. Now, in their defense, I will say that the 1903 was kept with the understanding that they would look to adopt a better uh, sight for it along the lines of the 1917. But, as Laura points out, that wasn't actually adopted until just shortly before World War II. Next question is from Frederick. It says, what guns will you be looking at in the future which you are the mostest hyped about? Uh, well, there are a couple. I would say in terms of modern guns, I'm actually really excited to get my hands on a Hudson H9. Um, having seen them at SHOT Show this year, or yeah, this year, um, I think that gun has a tremendous amount of potential, and I'm very excited to see if the production version of it lives up to the potential that we saw in the early prototypes that were at SHOT Show. So cross your fingers, I'm excited for that one. On a more historical note, um, I am really looking forward to one way or another getting my hands on an FRF1 or FRF2 French sniper rifle. Uh, you may notice I've reorganized my wall here to be all French bolt-action rifles get into exactly why in a few minutes, but um, an FRF1 or FRF2 would be really cool. I finally got my hands on one uh, recently. I, I did some traveling in Europe, including a visit to France, um, and did an interview with a gunsmith who had worked on those rifles, and he had one. Um, and that was the first time uh, in that interview I was able to actually handle one of those guns, and ooh, they're really cool. Um, most notably, they're way lighter than I was expecting, um, especially with just iron sights. That is a very lightweight rifle, and it's really interesting to look at how the decisions in the design of the FRF-1 kind of mirror the decisions that were made in the design of the Soviet Dragunov, um, in that you're balancing accuracy and speed of fire and durability and weight all together to come out with what is deemed optimal. Um, and both the Dragunov and the FRF-1 took a more more critical uh, look at weight than a lot of other rifles. So anyway, not exactly sure when that'll happen or how, but I would love to get my hands on and shoot an FRF-1 or FRF-2. Next up, uh, Christopher says, have you ever reviewed a gun at Julia or Rock Island and thought, I must make you mine? <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. Um, I have actually bid on a bunch of guns at both auction houses, and I've won a handful of them. Uh, most recently I actually won a Moss 38 submachine gun. Uh, got not my first machine gun, but it is actually it is my second machine gun, uh, and I'm very excited to get that. And um, it was one of those ones where I was looking at the estimate that they had and went, I don't really think it's gonna sell that low, but just in case it does, that's a gun I'd really kind of like to have, and it's a gun that doesn't show up for sale very often, and that one was a pretty decent example. Uh, unfortunately, someone stamped some numbers all over it, a service number, a serial number, or something. Um, 
be nice if they hadn't done that. Maybe that's part of why I got it for what I consider to be a fairly cheap price for a nice original Curio and Relic transferable machine gun. But yeah, every once in a while I do bid on rifles uh, that I've seen there and or done videos on. And sometimes I even win them. Not all that often. Uh, next up, Arturo says, in the spirit of your What Would Stoner Do project, which is an AR modernization, um, kind of making a modern AR based on the principles of the original ARs, and that's something Carl and I are doing over on InRange TV, we have a bunch of content about that. If you're interested in modern firearms and their applications, definitely go check out InRange TV. Anyway, uh, Arturo says, do you think Stoner uh, would today still choose direct gas impingement over a long or short stroke gas piston for the AR-15? Uh, if so, do you think he would still decide to house the recoil spring and buffer inside the stock? Uh, as for direct gas impingement, yes. I think Stoner would absolutely maintain that decision. It's not technically actually gas impingement. It is in fact a short stroke gas piston system where the piston is located directly inside the bolt carrier. Uh, the bolt carrier is the piston body, or the piston housing, and the bolt itself is the head of the piston. And that has some definite advantages. Um, it is commonly seen as being a reliability disadvantage, which in actual practical real world handling it is not. Um, you know, the, the, the common saying is it shits where it eats because gas from the action goes into that, uh, that piston system behind the bolt head. People see that as going into the receiver. It doesn't really. It vents out the side of the bolt carrier, uh, which you can see easily in slow motion. And on a properly built AR-15, it really does not contribute to uh, reliability problems. In fact, there's an argument to be made that because it does blow gas out the side of the bolt carrier with every shot, it might actually improve reliability slightly, in that it's actually blowing crud away from the ejection port just before the bolt opens on every shot. Now, more importantly, what that system does is it puts the, the, uh, the movement of the bolt, the unlocking, directly parallel to the axis of the bore, or directly in line with the axis of the bore, not even parallel, but collinear with it. So on a tilting bolt gun, for example, you're going to have pressure coming down each time, and it's going to put um, a, a one directional force on the cartridge and on the barrel. And that's a pretty minor thing, but when you're getting into trying to squeeze every bit of accuracy out of a rifle design, having all of those forces in line with the bore axis really does make a difference. And when you combine that with the multi-lug design, not just two, but like six or seven locking lugs on the AR bolt, those things are what really contribute to the AR-15 being a remarkably accurate gun in almost all of its configurations. Um, certainly, uh, a tilting bolt gun is not nearly as accurate. A two lug rotating bolt is pretty good, uh, but that multi lug rotating bolt really does a very good job. And that's because having a bunch of lugs ensures better repeatability on lockup. Um, if you only have one, it can kind of go into a number of different exact configurations every time it locks up. These are microscopically small, but they do make a difference on precision accuracy. Having a bunch of them kind of forces the bolt into exactly the same place every time it locks up, and that's what makes for an accurate rifle. Uh, as for the recoil spring being located in the stock, uh, that's one that's more, more suitable to maybe some redesign, but only if you are able to come up with a really good alternative. Uh, putting the spring in the butt stock has some advantages. The disadvantage, of course, is that it means you can't have a folding butt stock, or if the butt stock is damaged, you potentially the rifle becomes non-functional. On the other hand, um, having the, the spring and the recoiling, you know, the, the bolt recoiling into the buttstock gives you a very long distance of travel to play with. It allows you to have a long recoil spring uh, to more effectively slow down and stop the bolt without having it actually bottom out on the back end of the receiver of the gun. So that contributes to light recoil and soft shooting. Can you do it in other ways? Yes, the AR-15 as it's currently set up, I think is a pretty effective system. Um, I think in general people overestimate the importance of a folding stock. Having had a bunch of them, what I kind of find is you use it to transport the gun, but you don't really ever use it when you're shooting. Anytime you're actually going to use the gun, stock unfolds, so unless you have really serious space constraints where that really actually matters, is it that important? Yeah, I'm not, not convinced. Some specialty things, sure, 
would I would I give up the the benefits of having the st the spring in the stock of an AR for having a folding stock? No, I would not. There are options out there for people who do want that. They've never become all that popular, and I think for good reason. Uh, next question is from Ryan. It says, reading one of your old articles on the BAR, you mentioned that it was a horrible modernization of an otherwise decent weapon. If you had the ability to modernize the 1918 model, how would you have done it? Uh, well, um, you're correct. Uh, at least in my opinion, the 1918 A2, which is the World War II version of the BAR, I think went backwards in a lot of ways compared to the original World War I version. What if you gave it to me and asked my opinion, which actually you did, uh, I would follow the lead of several of the other countries that did modernize the BAR in a much more effective way. Uh, Poland did, uh, Sweden did, and uh, well obviously Belgium did. And I think the Belgians probably, well shoot, even the US did on the commercial market. Uh, Colt modernized the gun for the civilian, for civilian sales. Um, I would probably follow primarily what the Belgians did. They came up with what they called the FN Model D uh, for demontage, uh, because it has a quick change barrel. And the, the changes that they made were to shorten the barrel a bit, they dramatically lightened and simplified the bipod and moved it uh, a bit back on the gun. The, the 1918A2 has the bipod way out at the muzzle, which and it's a super heavy bipod. Um, the, the Belgian version has a much lighter bipod, it's farther back. Um, they, as the name implies, they made the barrel a quick changeable affair, which does make the gun a bit more serviceable in the light machine gun role. As it was fielded by the US, the BAR was really more of an automatic rifle. Um, it was not intended to be capable of, of sustained fire because you couldn't change the barrel. Um, or rather, you could change the barrel, but it took an armorer's bench and a pipe wrench to do it. So not something you can easily do in the field. It was pushed into the sustained fire role, absolutely, in World War II, also in Korea. Um, armorers, at least one armorer that I know, really detested that gun because of the number of times they would come in completely shot out from having been uh, pushed into service as a suppressive fire or sustained fire weapon when they just really weren't built for it. At any rate, um, making it a, giving it a quick change barrel solved some of that problem. Um, they also gave it a pistol grip, which I think is a, a substantial improvement, and then a good set of aperture sights. I think would make a big difference. Uh, the sights on the original 1918 are very similar to those that of a 1917 Enfield rifle, which is an excellent sighting system for the time at least. Uh, the A2 version went back to 1903 style sights, which are far too small, I think. Uh, most of the, the, the Polish and the Belgian version, and I believe also the Swedes, used what is basically a Mauser Model 98 rear sight, which is not bad. I think an aperture would be a bit better. Um, but a bunch of options out there. Uh, the one thing I would do that nobody else really did was to lighten the receiver. A uh, big, big reason for the weight of the, the BAR and its derivatives was that the receiver was a gigantic forged, just massive chunk of steel. And I think if someone had put work into it, you could have reduced the weight of the receiver substantially, and that would go a long way towards making the whole gun handier and lighter. In fact, if we look at the uh, HCAR, uh, Ohio Ordinances, um, modernized version of the BAR, they did that. In fact, they, they lightened the receiver substantially, and their gun is much handier as a result. In fact, there's a lot of those changes were made to the HCAR, actually. So, uh, Next up, Timothy says, why or how are large stockpiles of military weapons stored for extended periods of time, several decades, uh, and then released in large quantities for public sale. Why do militaries keep them around for so long and then decide to surplus them all at once? How do several well-known distributors, i.e. classic firearms of North Carolina, get these firearms in large quantities? And lastly, what type of firearm do you think might be next in line for large-scale surplusing? So a whole bunch of questions from Timothy there. Uh, first off, why do they do it all in a batch? Well, it's because bureaucratically they're, or logistically, they're all being stored in a batch. Uh, I think a good example would be like the uh, the Madsen, uh, the 1946 or 49 Madsen bolt action rifle. Uh, the Danes uh, tried to sell those on the international market right after World War II. wasn't a really a really good market for bolt action rifles at that point. Not new manufacturer ones. They managed to sell 5,000 of them to Columbia. Uh, Columbia got them, and then must have at some point realized we really have no need for these and nothing to do with them. 
because they were pretty much put into storage right away. And then a couple decades later they were surplused as a unit. Uh, they were all purchased by an American company, brought into the US, and they're all here now. Well the reason that they sold them all at once is because if the gun's obsolete, you either want a lot of them, so that should you get into World War III and need to issue all these rifles back out, you want to have as few different patterns as possible. So if, if all of your reserve rifles can be the same, everything becomes logistically simpler if you have to use them. If you have a relatively small number of these things, or if you've decided that you just don't need these rifles, get rid of all of them. Then you can get rid of all the spare parts, you can get rid of all the manuals, you don't have to train people on those things anymore. It's just simpler to do an all or nothing approach to this type of surplus. Um, another excellent example of this sort of thinking is Spain. Uh, after World War II, the Spanish had a huge, just a smorgasbord of different surplus firearms in their arsenal's inventory, because during the Spanish Civil War, both sides got just a whole mishmash of obsolete guns from all over the world. They all ended up kind of piled together um, after Franco won, and all of those guns were sold basically as a, a batch to a guy named Sam Cummings, who ran a company called Interarms. He brought them all into the US to sell on the collector's market, and for Spain this was a great way to take all of this obsolete junk, and you know these things went back to 1886, uh, Steyr straight poles, LaBelle rifles, Berthier rifles, um, all manner of old Mausers. They were able to clear all of this out, turn it into cash that they could use for something else, and dramatically simplify their arms stockpiling system. At that point, if it wasn't a relatively modern Mauser or a Setme, don't even bother with it, it's just simpler not to have them. And if you're going to sell in that way, the customers you're going to get uh, especially if these are obsolete guns, you're going to have a hard time selling them to other countries. Sometimes that works. Uh, Finland, for example, bought a lot of surplus arms uh, during the 1920s and 30s. Some of this stuff, you know, after a major war, sometimes you'll be able to sell surplus uh, to other countries who want to use it to rearm after World War II. Israel, for example, bought a lot of Mausers, Mauser bolt-action rifles, because they were still reasonably, they weren't obsolete at that point, but they were, the market was full of them. If you've got something like what Spain had, uh, or what Colombia had with bolt-action rifles in I think the 70s, no government is going to be interested in purchasing those because they're obsolete. So the market becomes firearms collectors, the mat, the, by and large the, the market for that is in the United States, especially more recently. Uh, other, other countries have had more difficult or more severe laws curtailing the import and the possession of military style rifles, or firearms in general. Uh, although interestingly England for a long time has been a hub for international arms sales like that. Um, it's often easier to bring guns from weird parts of the world to England, and then organize them, warehouse them there, and then export from England to the United States. This is something that's been done by a number of companies successfully. Um, in that they're, they're not actually selling on the British market, but British import-export regulations make it easier to do that than trying to bring things directly into the United States. Anyway, um, so how do well-known distributors get them? The answer is they're really a couple, historically there have always been a couple of really big companies that brought guns into the US, and then once they were here, those big importers then distributed them to distributors who then distribute them to retailers or sell them individually. And today the biggest one of those probably is Century, uh, Century International Arms. They have an abysmal reputation because often when they try to take parts kits and build them into guns, uh, they hire really the, the lowest rate contractor to do the job, and often Century built guns are not so great. They certainly have a reputation for being abysmal. However, there are a ton of guns that Century imports doesn't do anything mechanically to, they stamp the legally required import mark on them and then send them back out the door for sale, and those guns can be pretty much anything. Um, and I think you'll find uh, Classic Firearms is probably getting most of their guns from Century. Uh, Classic Firearms has actually, I think, has done a really good job of marketing in that they don't actually have a large quantity of guns. They'll have, from what I've seen when I look at their stuff, a dozen or two dozen different guns, um, individual examples, and they they have video content and they promote those and they let you see the specific guns that they're selling, 
and then they're able to sell those at a substantial markup compared to what you would be able to get for them if you just if you were a general firearms retailer and you said yeah we have Finnish M39s or we have M24 Mausers the condition is good here's the price and we'll take the one off the top you know whatever's on the top of the barrel for you uh, you can charge a higher price if you're actually showing people the one specific gun that they're getting um, people will see that they'll I think get an attraction or a, uh, they'll decide that they like that particular one and they'll be willing to spend more money on it um, if I'm not mistaken the the tags that are on those rifles um, in uh, uh, in classic firearms videos, those are all Century in inventory tags, and Century maintains a large inventory of these things. I think because of their marketing, Classic is able or willing to spend more on them than a lot of other retailers would be willing to, because they're able to get a higher rate for them. So um, that sort of stuff, those are things that have been imported. They've been in the country for a while, and I suspect they've been sitting at uh, Century uh, at prices that other companies just weren't willing to pay for them. So uh, if you look at a lot of the old advertisements like Hunter's Lodge advertisements in the 50s and 60s where some of these old classic ones where you see you know, machine guns for 20 bucks, Sturm Gewehrs for $24.99, that sort of thing. Um, Hunter's Lodge was one of the retail brand name outlets for um, Sam Cummings company, uh, Interarms. And so he sold mail order that way. And then he also sold to other distributors and Interarms would actually happily sell to other governments and did some of that. Uh, Bannerman was a company that did this before uh, Interarms. Century is a big company that does it now. That's where you see this sort of thing happening. I guess actually one other good example of this uh, is the the uh, Nepalese rifles that came into the U.S. through International Military Antiques, IMA. Uh, they did the same sort of thing, just like Sam Cummings bought out everything the Spanish had. Um, Alex and... Um, Oh, Christian Kramer uh, bought out everything that the Nepalese had. The Nepalese had stockpiled all the guns that they got from the British. Every time they upgraded or updated their arms, the old ones went into the stockpile and they just sat there. And so by the 1990s, they had an entire building full of flintlocks through early single shot cartridge guns. And they realized, you know, we don't really need these. I don't think we're ever going to have an emergency that's so dire that we're going to be reissuing you know, British 1853 muskets or Gehendra martinis. So let's let's just sell all of that off. And they put out bids, and IMA was willing to put the highest bid on them and bought the entire batch and brought them to England and then the US. And that's why all of those rifles became available here. Uh, as for what I think would be in line next for large-scale surplusing, it's hard to say. Um, a lot of it depends on geopolitical changes that aren't maybe easily predictable. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Russia, but a lot of the guns in Russia are actually legally protected or prohibited from export because they are considered um, state history. So for example, there are a lot of, there are a ton of Gatling guns in Russia that were made there. Um, there are a lot of Maxim machine guns in Russia. There are a lot of Smith & Wesson number threes. There are Berdan rifles in Russia. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Russia that would be very interesting on the American collector market. But I don't see any reason that I don't see any reason to expect that we'll see it. The reason that we did get a lot of Russian arms, especially Mosin Nagants, you know, this many several decade deluge of Mosin Nagants, was because of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Russian guns that had been Soviet now were being stored in places like Ukraine. Ukraine decided they didn't need 10 billion Mosin Nagants in long-term storage, so they started selling them on the collector market uh, to companies like Century. So it's possible something like that could show up um, if there are legal changes in Russia or someone decides to to, uh, to find another batch of stuff in one of the old Russian republics, uh, Soviet republics, sorry. Uh, it is, you know, a lot of the stuff that is being made obsolete now isn't really eligible for importation into the U.S. anyway. For example, France has just replaced the FAMAS with the HK416. However, it is extremely unlikely, I think, that we will ever see uh, FAMAS parts kits. There's zero chance we'll ever see FAMAS rifles in the U.S. Um, and that's partly because of U.S. machine gun laws and import laws. Uh, it's also partly because of French policy. They don't tend to sell uh, obsolete military arms on the commercial market these days. They did at one point, 
the Moss 4956 rifles, uh, when those were surplused off, when they were made obsolete, a lot of them ended up here in the US. Uh, but the FAMAS, not so much. I suspect a lot of those, some of them will go to uh, countries that France has a relationship with, probably a number of African countries uh, will get surplus FAMAS rifles as military aid, and unfortunately probably most of them will be destroyed once they're deemed not necessary in, sur in surplus stockpiles in France. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the 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 odds, uh, what I see on the horizon for new large batches of surplus, I'm not seeing a whole lot. I think we're on the tail end of that, because most of the stuff that would be legally able to come into the country probably already has. I don't think there are a lot of countries out there that still have big uh, stockpiles of bolt action or semi-automatic only uh, military arms that they're that they still have um, that are viable to be surplused. Next up, from uh, either Stefan or Stephen, I'm not sure which, uh, what are some key things to look for when searching for a collectible firearm? That is a short question with an incredibly long answer. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to do an entire separate video on that topic, so we'll be brief here today. A couple things, the most important thing is know what you're buying. Um, not just why are you buying it, but what exactly is it that you have? Do you know what this variation is? Do you know that it's a legitimate, assuming that you're interested specifically in military arms, do you know that it is in a legitimate military configuration? Um, if it's sporterized, you generally lose all of the military collectible value immediately. Uh, beyond that, uh, one of the common things is to look for matching serial numbers. Virtually every country put a serial number on the rifle, either the barrel or the receiver, and then stamped all of the component parts, or a large number of the component parts, with the same number matching that gun. Now originally this was done because manufacturing wasn't necessarily completely interchangeable, and so by serializing every part of the gun, you ensured that the parts that fit the gun stayed on that gun, and if anything was ever changed, you'd know it. Um, in modern, you know, today, I think that's largely an administrative logistical holdover. Um, it's good for accounting. And, and having serial, matching serial numbered parts on a gun improves its value from a collector's perspective. Now this is always, as with everything, this is subject to caveats. There are some guns out there that are simply virtually always mismatched. There are some guns where being mismatched isn't that big of a deal. And there are some guns where being mismatched is really pretty rare, and if you're looking for, for example, a Swiss K31 or G11 or K11 straight pull rifle, it's very easy to find those all matching. And I would encourage someone to pass on a mismatched rifle unless they get a really good deal on it. Make sure it's worth the money. On the other hand, if you're looking for a Labelle, Labelles are much harder to find in all original matching number configuration. So, eh, you know, that's something where you'd pay a premium for a gun having all matching numbers as opposed to wanting a discount if it doesn't have that. Uh, and then beyond that there are details to every individual type of gun that can have a substantial impact on its value. If it's Narasaka, does it have an intact chrysanthemum or has it been ground off? That makes a difference. If it's a Berthier carbine, does it still have the clearing rod or does it not? Um, has it been updated to ball N? Uh, there are these details on every, and on every different rifle, it's different things to look at. So education is the primary thing. Uh, Alright, next question I'm going to take is from David. He has two questions. First one is, who are the unsung heroes of Forgotten Weapons? Every now and then, although not much recently, you've had someone else using the camera while I did stuff. Who are these people? Uh, is it Carl from InRange? Is it random dude on the street? Wife? Husband? Who are they? Um, a lot of these people have legitimate full-time jobs and places in society, and I don't know how much they want to be tied into uh, some YouTube dude like me. So I'm going to leave a lot of these guys anonymous for the time being, pending actually talking to them. But uh, in general, if I'm working with a gun that belongs to someone else, uh, I may very well ask them to help out. They, they may be the person doing some of the camera work uh, while I'm on screen. Uh, when I'm at auction houses, there are a couple people at both Julia and Rock Island, who often help out doing that sort of thing. Um, it is primarily just me, but having extra people does help, um, especially in especially when we're out shooting on the range. If I'm doing a kind of a static position video like this, I really don't need another person behind the camera.
So anyway, at some point we may talk to some of those people in person, but I don't want to do it without uh, them being willing to be on on the YouTubes themselves. So uh, David's second question is, other than the possibility for Rimlock, why are rimmed cartridges a thing of the past other than 22 Rimfire? Was Rimlock such a major and unbeatable reason that it killed the rimmed cartridge, or are there other reasons? There are some other reasons, although Rimlock is a major one. Uh, Rimlock is typically what we would refer to for feeding a stripper clip uh, and having the rounds mix up in improperly and jam one rim in front of the other. More substantially is that designing a box magazine for a rimmed cartridge is much more difficult than a rimless cartridge. They just stack much more nicely. I know they've, they've been done. The Bren gun obviously, uh, the Dragunov, the um, well, everything in 54 rimmed, everything in 303, yes they were able to develop magazines for those, but it's just simpler and more reliable when it's a rimless cartridge. And then um, rim, now rim fire is not necessarily the same thing as a rimmed or rimless cartridge. Rim fire went away because it is a less economical, uh, in, in the overall picture it is a less economical system than center fire. Center fire cartridges are safer to manufacture, they're easier to manufacture, they're reloadable, which is something that especially early on militaries did. Uh, the US military uh, did collect brass and they did reload it. They did actually issue reloading kits that were sent out in the field with troops um, in the early days of center fire cartridges. So you'd have a way to, you know, the brass is the one thing that could be hard to get. Uh, powder and, and lead for bullets were reasonably easy to obtain, they were reasonably common. Uh, to find. If you carried some primers and a reloading kit, you could take your old brass and reload it. That's something you could not do with rimfire ammunition. Uh, with 22 rimfire, that has survived as a rimfire round because it is basically too small to be cost effective as a center fire cartridge. The whole point of 22 rimfire is that it is cheap and easily accessible, uh, and it, it wouldn't translate very well to a, a center fire cartridge. Uh, next up from Arno, uh, what is my opinion on the new rapid fire trigger systems like the Eco Trigger? I believe Arno is referring to binary triggers in general here, where you have the, the gun fires when you pull the trigger, and then it fires a second time when you let go of the trigger. I think they're kind of a dumb idea. Um, I have really no interest in having one myself for a couple reasons. One is a safety reason, um, especially combined with the general range protocols that people use these things in, which is blasting away at dirt or something similar. I think there's a real safety issue there. Um, basically, what do you do if you pull the trigger and fire the round and then you have a reason that you have to stop shooting? Uh, yes, you can do things like manipulate the safety, open up the action, there, there are ways to mitigate this, there are ways around this problem. But I don't like the idea of someone holding what is essentially a dead man switch on a rifle. Uh, much, much more, much happier to have just a standard pull trigger uh, on the rifle. And then secondly, what you get from them is simulated full auto, and we pretty much acknowledge that in rifles, shoulder rifles, automatic fire is really not particularly practical for most things. Uh, automatic fire is for machine guns with bipods. Uh, in a shoulder rifle, there's not a whole lot of need for it, um, and getting fake automatic fire uh, with something like a slide fire or a, a, uh, an, a binary trigger, uh, to me it's not worth the money and the hassle. Um, I don't think you'd get anything substantial out of it. So uh, I'm sure there are plenty of people who are going to disagree. I think there are a lot of people who find them very fun uh, to go out and shoot really fast. To me that's kind of turning money into noise. I can do that pretty effectively with a standard semi-auto trigger. I, I don't know, I'm probably offending people already. I, I don't see the glamour in, in the binary triggers. Uh, next up, from Donald. Do you think that a modern adaptation of the Kernka rotating bolt system could compete with some of the modern Browning tilting barrel systems in pistols? It seems to me that having a barrel that stays linear in its travel would be advantageous as opposed to a barrel that tilts out of vertical alignment with the sights when you fire. Um, yes, uh, yes and no both. So on the one hand, yes, it can absolutely compete, and we see that with like the Beretta PX4. It is a modern service pistol, it is totally effective, um, it's not you know, a barn burning seller. Uh, Beretta's not not making 
scads of money on the PX4, but it's a totally adequate gun. It has a rotating barrel system. Um, developed from the Steyr Han, which was sort of developed from the Kronka. Uh, the problem is it doesn't really add a whole lot. The concept seems good that yes, it should be uh, more accurate if the barrel's moving in line instead of tilting. The reality is people have gotten good enough at building Browning style tilting barrel pistols that you don't really get an advantage uh, with a linear rotating barrel instead. All right. Uh, Nicholas asks, what was your biggest surprise opportunity, as in an invitation to a collection or interview or randomly finding a unicorn, uh, what is the forgotten weapons related thing that left me most going, is this really happening? Uh, that's not that difficult of a question to answer. That would, I think, be the Walther 2000. Uh, getting an email out of the blue from someone who basically said, I have a Walther 2000, do you want to play with it? Um, that was pretty cool. That was a gun I really, I figured I'd probably find one for video eventually somewhere in Germany, uh, but it would probably be uh, a static, you know, it's in a museum or it's in a private collection and I'd, I'd be able to do a disassembly video on it, but that's it. I really did not expect I'd ever be able to actually take one of those out in the field and shoot it. <clears throat> uh, so when that happened, that was awesome um, and really took me by surprise. And I believe if I can ever find a PSG-1, that I have access to shoot, um, I think the opportunity still exists to take the Walther 2000 out with it and do a side-by-side -side shooting video, which I would really love to do. So we'll see if that happens at some point. Uh, Michael says, I have been reading up on Jeff Cooper's concept of the scout rifle. I'm curious what your ideas are on the concept and whether you think it's outdated. Well, I don't think it's outdated. I do think it is a very, very limited scope and that's why we don't see it being uh, used very much. So the concept of the scout rifle, uh, if I remember correctly, I believe Cooper called it, used a rule of threes. Uh, you wanted to be able to take down a 300 kilogram animal at 300 yards with a three kilogram gun. I, I think that was the standard. I probably should have looked it up before. Uh, but in practice, what this turned into was a bolt action rifle with detachable box magazines and integrated uh, bipod, good aperture iron sights, as well as an intermediate eye relief scope, uh, low magnification scope, and the whole idea was to have a rifle that was lightweight and very handy that could be brought up into a very quick shooting position so you could get good snapshots at targets, uh, you'd have backup iron sights if something went wrong with the scope, and chambered for a full power rifle cartridge. And there are two real iterations of this that came onto the market. One was the Ruger Scout Rifle and one was the Steyr Scout Rifle. The Steyr Scout was developed directly with Cooper's cooperation. As far as I know, the Ruger was not. Uh, and the Steyr Scout is this very cool, interesting, purpose-built rifle. It does, it fulfills all the requirements that Cooper had, including, you know, it has this fold-up bipod that just disappears into the stock and all polymer. It feels very flimsy, but it's very lightweight. It'll hold a spare magazine in the buttstock, lots of cool features to it. The problem is this is an answer to a question that was being asked by very few people. I think it would make sense probably for someone who is in like the uh, African safari guide profession. Um, I think Cooper had it in mind for some sort of like African brush war, long range sort of quasi civilian scout sort of person. Um, who might be hunting with it or might need to use it on human targets. In either case, there's a very small number of people who fit this role and very few, very, very few of them are in the United States. So I think a lot of people got excited about the concept and a lot of people bought the guns or built guns in this style. And I think what happened is then they went to start actually using them and realized that they didn't have anywhere to actually exploit this specific rifle build. Uh, and so they kind of died out in popularity and people aren't really all that excited about them anymore uh, for that reason. I think it's it's a cool gun. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with the gun. It's just only useful in such a limited role, especially especially relative to a buyer in the United States. And that's why we don't see them. At some point, I would really like to do actually a video on an original Steyr Scout because they really are cool guns. Uh, Christian says, what are your thoughts on shooting matching numbered guns? For example, I have an all matching G43 and I've installed an adjustable gas system in it. 
uh, to cycle just enough to eject the spent casing so the Bolton carrier isn't slamming itself into the rear of the receiver. Even after all of that, I still hear people claiming you shouldn't shoot them for fear of parts breakage. Um, I've even seen collectors forums also saying not to shoot matching car 98, saying, quote, you are throwing away money every time you pull the trigger. Technically those people are probably correct. Practically speaking, I have no problem, no qualms about shooting a matching numbered collectible gun. Uh, now, as with everything, this is, it depends. So there are some guns out there that are in literally factory brand new condition. Uh, and all matching is a part of that, but more important is the fact that they're totally mint, pristine guns. And yes, if you take that out to the range and you do a bunch of shooting with it, the shooting itself isn't what is a problem. What's a problem is, for example, if it's semi-auto, you're going to get brass marks on the receiver probably. If it's a revolver, you're going to get a scoring line where the, the bolt is dragging on the cylinder probably. Um, with an older gun, well, just handling at the range makes it very liable to nick the stock or scratch the stock or scratch the metal. That just happens to guns when you take them out shooting. So if I had a gun that was pristine, then I would agree with this, this idea, and I would not take it out shooting. In fact, I have a couple guns like that. Although as a general rule, I try not to collect guns that are that nice, because I want to be able to take my guns out and shoot them without having to worry about it. Uh, with something like a G43, if you've installed an aftermarket gas system, I'd just shoot it. Yes, there is a chance you'll break something. If you do break something, uh, you can generally get replacement parts. You certainly can for a G43. Yeah, they would then be non-matching. You'd have a, you know, a gun with all matching parts except for that one that you broke. But to me, the risk of it breaking is pretty slim, and the the enjoyment of getting to shoot the gun makes sense. I like that. Um, and that's how I would generally approach that question. Of course, it is always uh, something you have to consider the rarity, uh, how likely is the gun to break something, how difficult is it to get a replacement part. All of those things come into play, but I tend to err on the side of shooting my guns. Um, I think that is demonstrated most uh, on my 1917. Yep. Okay, so that gun's just out the top of the screen, but I have a, a 1917 French uh, semi-auto rifle, an RSC-1917 or FSA-1917, that I'm willing to shoot, and most, most people who own those would not be, because that is really a rifle where if I break something I'm kind of screwed, short of having a machine shop fabricate a new part. But the amount I'm going to shoot, the likelihood anything will break, I'm willing to, to take that risk. Uh, Stuart says, will you be doing more early guns? You seem mostly to go back only as far as the US Civil War, with just a few exceptions. Yep, that's true. Um, and that is really because my interest in shooting is pretty much restricted to cartridge firing guns. I've done some stuff with uh, muzzle loaders um, of all sorts. Uh, we've done some shooting with wheel locks. I don't know that I've done much with flint locks, um, percussion guns as well. To me, they're a pain in the butt to shoot. I just, I don't enjoy that part of, of shooting. I'd much rather be able to just stuff a cartridge in the gun and go. Um, I also find them more practical. People often ask, um, or occasionally ask, about things like, you know, do a two-gun match with a flintlock. Well, it's never going to happen, because you just, it's not practical. That thing has a rate of fire of like three or four rounds per minute tops. Two-gun matches are typically 60 to 90 second stages. That means, best case, I can fire six rounds total in the course of a stage. It, it's never going to happen. And I'm, I'm just less interested in it myself than, of course, uh, my ability to speak accurately and effectively on guns is based on the fact that I'm interested in them and I spend the time learning about them. The guns I'm less interested in, I know less about, and thus I am less likely to uh, present on video. So when I do have that sort of thing, when I like when I was when I had the video on on basics of wheel locks, that's something where I'm much more dependent on other sources. Uh, in that case, the owner of that gun. Um, helping me out with knowledge that I didn't have myself. So I tend to stick to the, I like to stick to stuff that I know. Um, I'm more confident in describing it to you if I'm confident that I know it myself, instead of taking someone else's word for it. Uh, long way of saying, I will primarily be sticking to cartridge firing guns. Although I guess that could change in a couple of years if, if my taste changes and I just get that spark to play with a lot of muzzleloaders, then you'll see a lot more muzzleloaders on the channel. 
All right, next up, Chuck says, while you have a real affinity for French designed arms, you also seem to be in the minority. So what are your thoughts on why they get such a bad rap? I would guess the bad experience US troops had with the Shosha in World War I would have a lot to do with it, uh, but what may be some of the other factors? Uh, as you can see here, I have, as I mentioned earlier in this excruciatingly long Q&A, I have rebuilt the Matrix Armory wall here to be full of French bolt-action rifles. Um, that is actually because I am very slowly working on a reference book on French bolt-action rifles that hopefully will be completed before I die of old age. Um, that's a subject I've found myself very interested in and kind of put together a pretty serious collection of them. Um, and it puts me in a good position to answer Chuck's question on why the French have a bad rap. Uh, it comes from a couple things. I think probably the largest single thing is France's capitulation after six weeks in World War II um, is something that got a lot of commentary in gun magazines and in the gun culture shortly after World War II. And what's really on kind of a, a sociological level is interesting to see there are a number of concepts that were solidified in the gun community in magazines like American Rifleman or some of the very early uh, shooting magazines in the 50s and the 60s that just stick today, um, even when they're not factually supported. Sometimes they are. Um, for example, the Arasaka being a strong bolt-action system. That goes right back to the 1950s. There was like one magazine article that made that a known fact in the community, and it remains that way today. And I think the idea that uh, France surrendered, therefore French rifles must be bad, I think that probably, I don't have a specific article I can point to, but to me it just tastes like something that came out of uh, gun publications in the 50s and 60s. And it's weird how that stuff is sticky. Um, you know, for people my age, our parents, our fathers mostly, um, read that, and because magazines were the source of information, we didn't have the internet back then, um, it was taken as, it kind of became gospel. Uh, and I think that's largely where the poor reputation of French rifles comes from. Now, what doesn't help them is that, is, is what makes them largely very interesting to me, and that is that they seem to have had this tendency to either adopt the very first cutting edge version of something, or the very last version of something. So the Lebel, for example, first uh, smokeless powder Spitzer cartridge rifle. It was groundbreaking. And it had flaws. The French rushed it into service to make sure that they weren't beaten to the punch. And as a result, they ended up with a very poor cartridge, the 8mm Lebel, it's 11mm Gras neck down to 8, basically. It's a heavily tapered cartridge, it's got a huge rim on it, it is terrible for magazines, and it set French rifle development back substantially several times. Uh, and other countries that followed suit, Germany, for example, Paul Mauser, was able to look at the label and go, wow, Spitzer is great, the, 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 the smokeless powder is awesome, that tube magazine is a really bad idea, that rimmed cartridge design is a bad idea, let me fix those, take the concept, improve it, and just a couple years later, introduce the Mauser bolt-action repeating rifles, which were fantastic rifles, because in part they were able to look at what the French with the first one did wrong. Um, French semi-automatic rifles are largely the same. Uh, the French did a lot of early development, ended up adopting a rifle in the 1917 self-loader that had some problems. It wasn't an ideal semi-automatic rifle, but countries like Russia and the United States were able to learn from the mistakes or the, the deficiencies of that and build a second generation gun that was excellent, like the Garand. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes the French will go the opposite direction and they'll adopt the very last version of something, kind of like the Moss 36. Yes, which you can see on camera. This is an extremely simple, rugged, effective bolt-action rifle adopted in 1936. Like, one of the very last bolt-action rifles to be adopted, and what happened there was it was only a couple years before someone else got the next major technological jump done with this. For example, the, the Moss 36 was adopted the exact same year that the US adopted the Garand, a self-loading rifle. And so while this is great, it's almost immediately obsolete. Kind of like where the Lebel was great, it was almost immediately made obsolete. 
you know, they just kind of don't have the luck there. Um, what makes for a really good rifle is being kind of the second generation. You don't, you don't want to be the first, you want to learn from the first, do it right, and then be able to field it for a long period of time before it becomes obsolete. And the French just had some timing issues in being able to pull that off. And I think that relates, that, that's a part of why they have a bad reputation in the US. They're kind of always a gun that's not good enough for their time. Um, or, or they're good, but only for a very short time before they get eclipsed by something else. Uh, Alex, we're almost almost at the end here, second to last question. Alex says, since Forgotten Weapons is diving into the SA-80 line, uh, the British bullpup uh, 5.56 rifles, what is your opinion on the L85A2 as it sits now as a combat rifle? And do you have do you ever see parts kits or full rifles being introduced into the United States? Um, I have done a little bit of shooting, very little, but I have done some shooting with an L85A2. It seems to be between combining my shooting with discussing the gun with some veterans, some British vets who have used it fairly extensively, as well as having used the L85A1 and the FAL. I think the A2 is a perfectly serviceable, adequate weapon. I think its main shortcoming is weight. That gun is heavier than it should be by several pounds. Um, the L85A2 is like, I think it's actually heavier than the FAL, the SLR, the L1A1 in British service. Uh, and part of the, the marketing, the plan for it, originally as the SA-80, was it would be substantially lighter than the SLR. That didn't happen. The thing is a beast of a rifle. It's way too heavy. Um, other than that, in the A2 configuration, it seems to be pretty reliable. It's, it's always been a pretty accurate gun. It's fine. I wouldn't choose a bullpup. I certainly wouldn't choose a bullpup that is completely non-ambidextrous, as the L85 is. Um, but it works. As for seeing seeing them here in the U.S., uh, dubious. Uh, we'll never see full rifles. They are machine guns manufactured after 1986. <clears throat> uh, even if that changes, the British government isn't really all that interested in selling machine guns to American civilians. So I would be shocked to ever see any quantity of L85s uh, in the U.S. on the market. As for parts kits, I'd be slightly less shocked, but still very surprised. I don't think the British government is interested, again, in putting the, in the, the PR of putting those into the hands of civilians. Uh, they could, the, the British have a, sem, or a manually operated version of the SA-80, uh, the L-98, I think it's either A-1 or A-2 now, um, that they legally could sell um, in the, on the British civilian market as well as the US civilian market, and they don't, and I think that's, that's a conscious decision on their part. And as a result, I think they would destroy the guns before they would sell them as surplus in the US. Um, of course, what they would be doing is selling the guns as surplus. They would come in through a, an importer in the US who would then chop them into parts kits to comply with US law. But it's a moot point because I don't think it'll ever happen. And last question is from Jim, who says, with all of the traveling that you've been doing, have you considered taking us on a tour of some relevant locations in other cities? I think it would be interesting to get your take on, for example, an actual World War I battlefield, um, historical outside places. The answer, Jim, is yes. Not only have I given some thought to that, I have actually done some of it. Although, as of the recording of this video, you probably, well, I know for a fact you haven't seen it. Uh, I recently took a trip into Europe, um, and one of the things I did there was actually spend an entire day at the Ypres uh, battlefield, or rather around the various Ypres battlefields in Belgium. And I recorded a bunch of video there. Uh, I have some video of the Menin Gate ceremony that we'll be publishing, as well as uh, some tours. I, I did some walkthrough video of a German trench system, a British trench system, a Belgian trench system, some video on some bunkers, a lot of cool stuff out there. And that video will actually be coming to InRange TV, because I think it's kind of more appropriate there, where we are talking about more uh, warfare and its implications, uh, where Forgotten Weapons is more specifically focused on firearms, um, specific firearms. So if you're interested in that type of content, I would strongly suggest that you check out InRange TV. Um, there's always a link in the description text of every Forgotten Weapons video to take you over there. Um, that is a collaborative project with myself and my friend Carl Casarda. So that's where you'll be seeing those videos. I don't know exactly when we'll start publishing some of that Ypres Battlefield stuff, but 
probably sooner rather than later. So keep an eye out for that. As always, these questions have been uh, submitted by some of the folks who contribute to support Forgotten Weapons through Patreon. If you enjoy what you see here, uh, I would greatly appreciate a donation. A buck a month um, is all I ask, and that contribution goes an incredibly long way towards allowing me to maintain the channel, uh, the volume of content that I'm able to put out, and especially now, having met uh, a couple of major fundraising goals, I'm able to do quite a bit of traveling. So you will be seeing some video coming up from a number of different European collections, some really cool guns that we can see in Europe that just simply don't exist here in the United States. And it's thanks to Patreon that I'm able to keep doing that. So thanks to all of you guys, and thanks to everyone for watching.